Hello, John Bellucci here uh, in front of my little shaving machine, my rawhide shaving machine, which is, the machine's pretty close to 30 years old by now. Um, I'm going to do a little demonstration here today. I've got a uh, cape that I purchased from a buyer on eBay uh, from New York State, up to, uh, upper New York State, and uh, he coated it with dry preservative. Now, I don't use dry preservative myself, but what it did do, and it's a good chance to take advantage of this situation, it tightened up the skin enough to be able to shave it over this machine. And uh, I'm gonna give a little demonstration. I, there's not gonna be a lot of narration in it. I will get the camera in close so you can see what's happening. The, uh, the biggest thing to learn when you wanna use one of these machines is Quite simply, uh, it's all a matter of feel. Uh, um, heavy-handed guys like myself, I say heavy-handed because, you know, I do everything tough, you know, and harm hard on things and tools and whatnot. You have to have a light touch when you're using this machine. Otherwise, instead of shaving off thin layers of, of the hide to get it even, you'll gouge the hide and cut right through it. This is a round knife. Um, it is a circular blade with a turned edge so that the blade is like so and the edge comes out at a right angle. And you can control the amount of hide you're going to remove by how you, how you use your sharpening steels. And the little sharpening steels I have here are very simple and nothing fancy. They are a hardened steel, little uh, sharpening steels. And the way you put, the way you use them is as the machine is, as the wheel is, the blade is turning, you go under the lip, like so, and then over the top, starting level, and then lightly, lightly, and you're not pressing into this. Again, you have to have a light touch. You lightly angle the top sharpening steel slightly downward. So you're getting just, just ever so slightly, um, biting edge on this thing. Um, now, like I said, this, this company is no longer in business. This is the brand I learned on. I learned at the elbow of Mr. Sinclair Clark, the master of the round knife. And when I learned, we didn't have the brass guides like we have on these machines. Uh, Sinclair didn't believe in using them. Uh, he preferred to develop the touch of the machine using your own sense of touch itself and not depend so much on the guides. And um, Sinclair had a saying that he told me when I started with him, whatever you do, never let your mind wander. Don't let your mind wander. And uh, it's good advice because without the guards, uh, the first couple of skins I worked on, I guess my mind wandered. And I ended up taking off the ball of my hand down here by the, on the base of my thumb, I took a layer of skin off. Didn't realize what I did until it started to sting a little bit and I looked down and all these little pinpricks of red were showing and that's when I realized I had cut myself on the machine. And Sinclair saw it and he says to me, you let your mind wander, didn't you? I told you, don't let your mind wander. Well, he grabbed me by the hand and plunged it into his bite. Now his bite was his own pickling solution, which I believe is salt, water, uh, there may have been some alum in it or aluminum sulfate, but there was definitely sulfuric acid. And he dove my hand down into this water and it stung. And I griped and howled about it and he says, give it a minute, it'll stop hurting. Well, it did stop hurting. And he asked me, are you good enough to go back to work? I said, yes, sir. He says, all right, get on there. And remember, don't let your mind wander. Best advice, besides using a light touch on this machine, is to concentrate. Do not distract yourself with anything. Do not let your mind wander. Thank you for that, Sinclair. Wherever you are in the great beyond, my friend, it was a, it was a, a lesson well learned. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and unwrap this cape now. And um, we're gonna get started on uh, putting an edge on this machine. I'll give a little advice on, on uh, oiling it and how I clean it up and whatnot. And uh, we're gonna go from there. So, come along. Hopefully, I can teach you a little something and pass what Sinclair taught to me onto you.
thanks a lot. All right, so the first thing I do, I want to prep the um, prep the blade for the day uh, for the day's project. And to do that, I take a little bit of WD-40. Okay, take a look here at WD-40 and a piece of steel wool. And these two items together are going to work to prep the blade. Um, I also put a piece of brown paper. Here we have a, uh, a brown paper sack from uh, 50 pounds of salt. And, uh, only to catch the, uh, the, the oil as it comes shooting off the blade. It will come shooting off the blade and it goes quite, a, it goes quite far. So we're going to turn on the, we're going to turn on the, uh, the machine and I'm going to spray some WD-40 on the blade as it's turning. And then I'm going to hold this steel wool pad in one spot. You don't have to move it around because the blade is turning. So there's no need to move this around. Where you put it is where it will, uh, you only need to keep it in one spot. The blade, the rotating blade does the rest of it. You know, it's, it cleans it. Nobody's comes back. Okay, here we go. It's a little noisy. Actually, it's a lot noisy, but that's okay. All right. Give a shot at WD-40. And now the steel wool. And we'll go from back to front. Front to back. And this just cleans any residual salts or grime off the blade. Now I'll take my sharpening steels and I will go ahead and sharpen the blade. The first one goes under the lip, like so. The first one goes right under the lip, very lightly. The second one goes across the top, and it's slightly turned down. That's it. That's all she wrote. That's all you need. Uh, the more it, it will be sharpened as we go along working on the on the cape and you see here how the oil did shoot up along this brown paper sack all right move that out of the way put the steel wool pad back in the tool chest for next time and we're going to prepare to shave the hide again <coughs> these are not really used for fleshing fleshing is done by hand uh, fleshing will fleshing a raw skin will tend to um, catch the debris of the red flesh and the, the meat in the blade and just cause you more problems than it's worth these were designed for shaving the skin thin so we're going to turn it on again and here we go See, a piece of hide has been shaved thin. Okay, it's been shaved thin. We're going to continue this on the entire cake. Now, I won't record the, the whole thing for you, but I'm going to show you getting started. Now, I don't, I don't do this a lot anymore. Uh, at 62, I've developed a bad shoulder, which was dislocated when I was younger, and a touch of arthritis in my hands, so this isn't really fun or comfortable anymore, but I do want to show folks how it's done. See the heavy, heavy texture of the hide here? I'll take that away. See it's smooth. This will give the hide stretch that it otherwise will not have. And you'll be able to get an accurate measurement for your head form. Now, <laughs> this hide, when I purchased it, it read that the, um, the description read that it was a six and a half inch face. Well, it's not quite. It's more like seven and five eighths, which is quite a bit different. And uh, he said he got a 22 inch neck. And well, this, this skin, since I shaved it right behind the ears, is about 23 and a quarter, 23 and a half behind the ears. So, 
shows you what proper shaving will do by giving you an accurate size for ordering a head form. Because it thins the hide little by little. Our Shakespeare said, brick by brick, my citizens, brick by brick. Well, bit by bit, my friends, bit by bit. You want to be careful not to punch the hide, any of the hide, under the blade, or you will, you will slice a, you will put a slice in the in, in the skin. Don't let the hide bunch up under the front of the blade. You always want to keep it ahead of the ahead of the knife. You know, those of you who send your hides out, like I do. Uh, try to be a little more understanding if they develop a little cut in the hide <coughs> because it happens. And those guys at the tannery, they're, they're doing mass quantities a day. So they go as carefully as possible. Now we're going to go on to the face. Okay, the facial portion right here. I'm going to take this down a little bit. And again, you want to be careful. You want to hold the skin taut and be ve have a very, very, very light touch. There, you see that. And you see how that's been shaved. Okay. How it's been shaved. Here's the shape. I don't know if it's picking it up. <laughs> Let me shut this off. Okay, right here, we've got the shaved portion, right here, and this is the unshaved portion of the hide, right here. You can see, you know, where the slice marks were made during the skinning process. We're going to take those down and make those go away, and we're going to thin the skin in the process very, very lightly. you need to manipulate the skin, put it where you need it to do the job that needs to be done. up to the crown of the of the deer's uh, scalp. The crown, which is of course, you know, the top of the deer's scalp. And that's where the hide is the thickest. Especially on a good sized buck. Back on this plate because this is a 
it's not a pickled hide, it's a dried raw hide. So, you know, it's a little rougher on the blade than it needs to be. By the way, the guards are set, what I call close. They're close together, side to side, and they're close forward and back. There's just a small portion of blade that is, that is exposed at the bottom of the, of the guards. exposed portion is one of the reasons when you get a hide back you need to get in there with your knife and shave the crown down by hand uh, it really doesn't pay for the shaver to put their hand under the hide and try and get to the very very edge some guys do some guys are adept There's no reason to be afraid of this knife, but you must respect it. It is a tool. And it is a tool that will take a layer of skin off. So like any tool in our industry, it needs to be respected and used with a certain amount of care. I don't want to cut the eyelids, so we... You move, the, you move the hide around however you need it to do the job that needs to be done. Okay? Oh, yeah. Here we have a cape that's shaving down nicely. You can see the shaved portion. All right. And the unshaved portion. Okay? Tannery usually stops the shaving about at the ear, at about this part here. Ear, at about this part here, right here. And you need to shave it by hand the rest of the way. Now, because the tannery is doing many, many hides, and the shavers are doing one after another, and basically they get shaved by how many they do. When you're tanning your own, you can go a little higher. But remember, any holes you put in, you have to blame yourself and not the tannery. This time. Again, you avoid holes by using a very light touch and going very gently. Another reason you don't want to put your hand under the hide for shaving, the the hide will press down against your hand while it's making contact with the blade and that will develop a deep cut in the hide and possibly a cut in your glove which will then lead to a cut in your fingers or your hand. So avoid that at all costs. Avoid doing that at all costs. Now we're going to get the edge here of the incision. not hold a stitch, okay? Again, this is all 
developed over time. It's a matter of getting a feel for your knife and for working on the hide. I would suggest you work on scrap hide, extra extra capes, take in extra capes during the hunting season, just you know, trade them out for antler mounts or what have you. Salt them, pickle them, practice on them. You will develop the feel for them. I'm hitting a dry spot in the hide and I want to be careful because I can end up going right through. Because remember, this is not a pickled hide. No, 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 no. This has just got dry preservative on it. So, as you can see, you can see here, I hope you can see here, the part that's been shaved, okay, like so, here it's been shaved, here it is unshaved. Let me pull this back here a little more so you can see. There we are. Here's the shaved section, shaved portion right here, and here, my best van of white is the unshaved portion. That's what's involved in uh, taking the thickness of the hide down. It is very involved. Okay? It's not easy. The shaving machine is not a panacea, it's not a magic bullet. It's hard work. It makes the work of thinning down a hide a lot easier than doing it by hand over a beam, but it is, again, it is a method to doing the work that we do. And as a taxidermist, you need to learn to use your knives, skinning knives, flushing knives. Uh, it wouldn't hurt at all to learn how to use a shaving knife, a shaving machine, a round blade, as Sinclair called it. Here's the area we shaved on the, on the head, okay? and the unshaved area. So around the eye where it's been shaved and the other eye where it has not been shaved around the eye. The shave below it, here, right? Generally speaking, uh, some folks recommend, you know, just start and go around and around and around. Don't bounce around like I've been doing here. But this is for demonstration purposes and if you do that, if you go here and there and everywhere and end up back to where you were, you have less chance of becoming bored with doing it. This is tedious work, but it's thorough work. And uh, really, that's all that matters. Um, let's go down to the bottom half of the hide, the cape, down here. Okay, right here. I'm gonna take this down just a little bit. This is not a pickled cake. This is simply a cake that had dry preservative put on it. I then put it in the freezer for a few hours to freeze it up and then took it out later, the, later that evening. Now, there. now, you can see we're getting a good amount of stretch here. See that? A good amount of stretch. That was otherwise not there because of the coating of the, the tissue that was on top of the skin. We're taking that down. Now where you want to be careful is in the armpit area. That can have a hole busted through it very easily. That part of the skin is very thin. Where the forelegs are and where the armpits are located at the brisket. Very thin. Go slow, keep a light touch, and don't let your mind wander. Words of wisdom. 
words to live by.
stretch. Unbelievable. Very good. incision area very taut as tight as you can hold it and go over lightly oh beautiful beautiful fantastic when you get the stretch on these capes more than you imagined you would fantastic here we go all right Okay, we give it, we're going to give it a good stretch. Look at that stretch. Unbelievable, eh? Unbelievable, eh? One side. Now we stretch the other side. Good stretch. Stretch the bejesus out of it. All right, this thing has ended up bigger than the seller thought it was gonna go. This is huge. This is a huge animal, huge animal. All right, let's get the, uh, let's call out the uh, tape measure. There we are. All right. Mama don't dance, your daddy don't rock and roll, and you, my child, is that is the reason you, my child, don't it. Oh, my child. 22 on the neck, right behind the ears. Actually, it's about 22. I've got 22 and a quarter, right behind the ears. Go a little further down. Further down here. Here. Tonight, the Mar Night at 7 30, Fan Appreciation Nights at Cyclone Community Gross Bank Arena. There's an Easter celebration at the zoo tomorrow from uh, 24. Open that day on Sunday. If you want to go watch the 24, about three inches down from there. And a lot of head forms are giving, like research mannequins, they're giving. <coughs> <coughs> another measurement even further down still further down still all right and what we've got here 
sponsored by Burlington. Get everyone needs to ready for less in Burlington store shirts, suits, and more. We got 27. So we've got 22, 24, 27. This will go over one of Bill Lancaster's monster whitetails, which is good because I've got a rack that I want to mount up. It was a rack I was trying to sell for years. No one bought it. So I'm like, well, the heckle and jekyll with it. I'm going to mount them. I'll probably make a pedestal out of them, pedestal mount. Yeah, it's a lot easier than trying to put them on a wall somewhere in a log house where there's not a lot of good places to hang deer heads on the walls. And let's go pull this face right side out in just a moment. And get them situated like so. Here we go. That's right. You stretch them top to bottom. You stretch them lengthwise, yeah, you're going to get a, a ridiculously long face. Deer walks into a bar, bartender says, hey, guy, what a long face. We've got, oh my gosh, we've got seven and three quarters. I got seven and three quarters on this face. Okay, seven and three quarter by 22, 24, and 27. It's a hell of a deer. That's a hell of a deer. Let me put this on the tag here. Let me mark this on this tag. Seven three quarter. Joseph Toyota. You want to buy your next vehicle at Joseph Toyota because for the fourth year in a row, they're number one in customer satisfaction. By twenty two. By twenty four. By twenty seven. I spoke Spanish. I can see it. Uh, yeah. All right. I'm going to continue and shave the rest of this hide. Uh, I wanted to get the measurements that I got, so I got I went as far as I would go on camera, just to show you the kind of stretch that you will get, or that you can get, from a hide that's been uh, properly shaved, and uh, it's a great thing. It's a great thing, and. Uh, I'll bring I'll bring the antlers over that I want to put under this guy, under this fella. I mean, they are tremendously large. And the nice thing is this cape will fit around the antlers. You bang these two things together in the woods, boy, you're going to get a monster buck. This is the rack I thought. Well, if it doesn't, if it doesn't stretch out large enough, I'll go with this one here, which is a rack I bought. Uh, this rack is from Minnesota. You know, it doesn't help when you can't see it. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Focus on. All right, this rack here is from Minnesota. And I thought, well, if he doesn't go big enough for the large, large rack, which came from Canada, I'll use this. But as it is, this rack will be too freaking small under that cape. So we'll put this nice rack aside and bring in the good size monster rack, which is probably 150 to 160 class. This beast here is from Canada. No one wanted to buy it. Too bad. Now, now it's garbage. No. There we go. Fits like it was made for it. Like they were made for each other. This will be quite the impressive animal in the showroom. And maybe, maybe at a outdoor show or two. 
the rack is very heavy. I didn't weigh the, didn't take a weight on the rack, but it feels like it's about, I don't know, close to 10 pounds, maybe. Or maybe I'm exaggerating myself. But anyway, I'm gonna continue on with this. And uh, when I get them completed, I'll show the entire finished cape uh, on camera. Thanks for watching. Here's Johnny. Well, it's the next day and I did complete the shaving of the cape and after that I took him and washed the cape thoroughly. I used about, uh, this was about four or five gallons of water, a couple of cups of salt, uh, about a, uh, one cup of salt and a couple of ounces of Camel 4. Mixed it up, mixed the solution up thoroughly and dunked this bad boy in it, scrubbed it, pulled him in and out, flesh side, hair side, hung him up for several hours to drip dry, rolled him in a towel overnight, and here he is. Now, what, what this is, this is still a raw hide, okay? This is not a tanned or pickled hide yet. And <clears throat> bear in mind that when I was shaving the skin, I was shaving a raw skin that simply had a dry preservative rubbed onto it. So it wasn't really plumped the way your skin would plump after taking it out of a pickle, which is an acid bath. Uh, and the acid, of course, causes the skin to swell or plump. And that allows the, the round knife to get down many, many layers to get a nice stretchable cape. But I did show that this cape had a lot of stretch, even for what it was. Uh, let me turn him inside out and show you what we've got here in the way of a nicely shaved hide. Uh, he appears very white on the inside. He appears to look just like any other pickle and shaved hide, but he has not been pickled. And I would not mount this as is. All right, I do not mount dry preserved skins. I would not mount this as is. But I do want to show that I was able to get in close to the eyes, down the side of the muzzle, and the lower jaw has been shaved a bit. Sides of the face are, sh are shaved real nice. There's good stretch in the skin. I shaved up to the base of the ears, as you can see here. Okay. The skin itself has been thoroughly shaved, although I would, I would, let, I would notify the tannery that this has been, that this hide is partially shaved or semi-shaved, lightly shaved. Uh, after he drained, uh, he is now ready for salting. He will be salted, hung on a stretcher for a couple of days, rolled up, shipped off to the tannery with explicit instructions on how he was handled, how this cape was handled. And to let them know that I brushed a ton of ticks out of the lower portion of this cape. I guess New York State last year had deer that were infested, just infested with ticks. It happens, it happens, it happens all across the country. Uh, deer become infested with ticks and some summers are worse for them than others and that of course leads into the fall. But this hide here, when he comes back in the tannery, I send him to uh, the Wildlife Gallery Tannery and I have an alum tan done. Now a lot of people like to, they like to uh, support uh, synthetic tans. I'm not a synthetic tan guy. Also discover that the Wildlife Gallery uses the Sinclair clock formulations for tanning. You're not going to beat that with a stick, all right? So when he comes back from the tannery, there's going to be even more stretch than, than was demonstrated here on the table yesterday with the tape measure. Um, to get his ear measurements, I, I can, there are three ways you can measure the ears. You always measure from the base of the Y to the tip. Now, not onto the very tip, there's hair here, but to about this point on the, on the ear, that's for length. Then you can measure, cartilage is still in here, you can measure from the top edge to the bottom edge, just straight down. Another measurement you can do is around 
the ear at that same point. Start from the top curve, go around to the widest point on the bottom of the ear, and some ear liners are sold with that kind of measurement. Um, I'm ordered, I've ordered a head form for him from Research Mannequins. I'm going with the Bill Lancaster, one of the monster white tails. Uh, the face on this was measured at seven and three quarters. I'm going to use a seven and five eighths face. Uh, seven and five eighths nose, uh, uh, eye to nose, corner of the eye to nose, and thirteen and five eighths, or thirteen and a half, measured from the tip of the nose to the back of the head. Uh, then there is a uh, there's twenty two, twenty four, and five eighths, and then twenty seven and a half. And the measurements I took were almost spot on to those measurements. And uh, he'll be going together on that form. Again, after coming back from the tannery, there's going to be plenty of stretch on this big hide. And this is much, much bigger than the gentleman I bought it from thought, it, uh, thought he had sold. So I'm grateful for that. The price couldn't beat it. Uh, I'm not going to divulge the price, only to say that... Uh, for a raw skin this size, it was an excellent price, and I'm real happy with it. And uh, I'm sure he'll make up into a beautiful display piece. So until we meet again, hope you learned something, got a little something out of this. So until next time, adios amigos.